Okay, start out uh, turning in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, today, this isn't going to be a real heavy doctrinal message. Um, probably not going to learn anything new. It's just going to be a kind of, re- of a review of a lot of familiar scriptures. But the point is here, it's uh, this time of the year a lot of people make New Year's resolutions. And this is a good time to kind of reflect on 2010 and look towards 2011 and I'm just going to go over some real light verses today like I said it's not going to be a big doctrinal real heavy study here but uh, just some things to cover keep in mind not only about last year but but the year to come Uh, how did you spend 2010 as you as a Christian did you do good Is there room for improvement? Did you learn new things? Did you witness to somebody? Did you pass out tracts? How was your prayer life in 2010? But uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. This is something you need to remember. It says here, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now that's one of the greatest gifts that the Lord's given to us. Because that happens at salvation. Your past sins are forgiven. But this is available to you anytime you pray. So if you really blew it in 2010, you can confess those sins, you can forsake those sins, and you can move forward and have a different year in 2011. You're to forget those things. We're going to be, I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, old things are passed away. And you can forget the things that are behind. If you messed up in 2010, that doesn't mean the Lord can't use you in 2011. Okay? Forget the things that are behind. Uh, Turn next to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Paul's talking about the power of the Lord. And uh, he's saying that he hasn't apprehended. He's not perfect as far as uh, his walk with the Lord. But he says here in verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Did you mess up this year, this past year, 2010? I did. Well, then you should really think about those mess-ups and you should just agonize over it and worry that you're going to do it again. Uh Uh-uh. It's not what it says. Forgetting those things which are behind. Move forward. Press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You're going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ someday. And what you need to do is, okay, you messed up, forget it, move forward. Confess it, forsake it, move forward. That's very important to remember. Okay? You say, well, what about the confess it thing? 1 John chapter 1. Go there. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. We're going to look at the confess it. Okay, it says here, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Notice it doesn't say we deceive the Lord. We deceive ourselves. <laughs> and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Lord knows what sins you've committed. If you messed up in 2010, confess it to the Lord. And He's faithful and just. He'll forgive those sins. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I always find it fascinating that the lost world, you can't get them to confess that they are sinners. Why is that? Because the word's not in them. They don't regard this book as their final authority. So you say, are you a sinner? Well, I don't think I'm that bad. You say to anybody here this morning, are you a sinner? Yeah. (laughs) Amen. Why? Why? Because you know what God's standards are. His word is in you. Okay? 
So if you're listening to this message and you say, well, I don't, I don't think I sinned this past year at all, uh, you're a liar. Just as simple as that. You're to know that you're a sinner and you are to confess those sins and you're to move forward. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. So you confess your sin. Now you say, well, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sins. So I can just go ahead. 2011, I'll just continue in my sins. Right? Wrong. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You're not to continue in your sins. Jump down to verse 6. It says here, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Jesus paid for your sins on the cross, and the body of that, your old man, was destroyed there on the cross. Why do you want to continue in those sins? You need to forsake those sins. Jump down to verse 11. It says here, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. You know, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And that applies to the lost especially, but it also applies to people that are saved. All sin will lead to death. Okay? It's, you, you, there's no such thing as a sin that's good for you. That's good for your body. Okay? You need to forsake sin. That's very important. If you want to have a healthy, happy life, both spiritually and physically, you need to stay away from sin. Jump down to verse 14. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Okay, don't mess around with sin. Okay, it's it's not something that you want to do. Turn over to Romans chapter 8. Now, the first part of the thing there is, when you sin, the things that you messed up on in 2010, first you confess it, then you forsake the sin, and now you move forward. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Make sure that you're walking in the Spirit. Okay. And by the way, when you confess your sin... The Bible says that God is faithful and just to forgive those sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That means you don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay? It's gone. Forget about it. And your flesh and, and you know, the devil, he will remind you of the things that you messed up on in the past. And he'll want you to dwell on that and say, man, I'm going to blow it again in 2011. I'm going to mess up. Don't do that. Confess it. Forsake it. Move forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 next. We're just going to hit a couple verses in this study here today. Like I said, it's, this isn't going to be a real heavy doctrine kind of a message. Just a reminder. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 31 through 32. It says here, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged... But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Judge yourself. Okay? I'm not saying that you shouldn't think about your sins. You should think about your sin, and you should judge it according to the Word of God. And you should, But when you don't, the Lord will chasten you as a son or a daughter. Okay? But you're not going to be condemned with the world. You're not going to lose your salvation. And have to be resaved. Okay, there is no such thing in the church age. That's just not there. Now, go to Second Timothy chapter three. The question comes up: Well, how is 2011 looking? 
Uh, are things getting better? You know, are we looking at a, a real great year ahead of us? Well, if you go to some churches, you'll probably be told that. <laughs> but you're not going to hear it here. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. It says here, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We aren't really in it too bad right now. Yeah, there are hate crimes out there. Yeah, there's sodomites. There's a bunch of other radical people that want to that that don't like Christianity. But we're not really that bad. I mean, go back to the Dark Ages, you know, and even back to the first century. We don't have it that bad right now. But things are going to keep getting worse, and you see that in verse thirteen. It says here, "But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived." But Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I'm a little bit uh, ticked off right now, I guess you could say, because I've had contact with with brethren that were heading in the right direction, and they, you know, they believe. Oh, you know, I believe in the King James Bible, and I believe in you know eternal security, and and the things that they've learned and have been assured of. And now one brother, he's starting to go back. And he's starting to listen to false prophets. And now he's starting to question. Well, maybe it isn't. Well, well, maybe I don't know. For That's bad. That's real bad. And it's not just a small doctrine. It's major doctrine. You know, and I've seen so many people, I used to be King James only, but now I'm not. What's the problem? You know, and and there again, I had somebody else contact me and, and, you know, well, I heard about Gail Ripplinger. She has some sins in her past, so I don't know if I can be, you know, King James only or something now. I, you know, because then I'd have to support Gail. Gail Ripplinger's not the issue. Is this God's book or isn't it? You know, are you going to continue in the things that you've learned and been assured of? A lot of people aren't going to. Okay, and we're going to see that here as we continue. Uh, one of the things that we will teach you here at this ministry, both through King James Video Ministries and here at Bible Believers Fellowship, we'll give you all the information you want on the perfection of the King James Bible. This is God's book. God's Word has to exist somewhere on this planet in a perfect form, and I believe that the King James Bible is it. That's what I believe. Okay, you don't believe that? Well, contact me. I'll give you some information. Now, in 2011... It's going to be the 400th anniversary of this book. And that's good and bad. It's good because there's going to be a lot of people asking questions about this book, but it's bad because all the false prophets are going to be lying. They're going to lie about this book. Okay? So that's something that we have coming up here this year. That's good and bad. There are also two new versions coming out this year. The NIV and the CEB, Common English Bible. The newest NIV... They're going to be coming out with two new versions. And I'll tell you what, every time these new versions are coming out, you see God's wrath and judgment coming. Every single time. You know, America was going along good till we got the American Standard Version. England was going along good till they got the Revised Version. And each new version that comes out, you see more evil coming. People don't really realize how bad these new versions are. But, so it, you know, it's coming this year. We have that to look forward to. Are you going to stand for the King James Bible? The things that you've learned and been assured of, are you going to stand for it? You know, and, and, you know, again, let me just say something else. And this is, you know, to some of the people out there, why are you wasting your time listening to the enemy? People send you this stuff, you know, oh, uh, Gail Rippling or, you know, she's this and she's that and she said this and that. I don't even read that stuff. It's a bunch of garbage. Oh, what about Ruckman? Oh, you know, he, Ruckman, did you hear about his past? I don't care. This is God's book. I'm not even going to read that stuff. Well, you need to be able to answer everything. No, I don't. No, I don't. Right here. This is God's word. You're not going to move me from that position by the grace of God. I mean, but anyhow, unless it's under torture or something. Uh, number two, the economy is going to continue to get worse and crime's going to increase. It's going to happen. And a lot of people, as a result, they're going to see this bad stuff coming, and it's already happening, and they're going to abandon the pre-tribulation rapture. It amazes me. I'm seeing it 
all over the internet, people are radically against the pre-tribulation rapture. And they're saying, Jesus is not coming back. You're going to have to endure to the end. See? That's what they're saying. And there's more and more and more people doing it. And when you and you say, well, it, you know, it's not a big deal. Oh, yeah, it is. When you abandon the pre-tribulation rapture, you'll get messed up in two areas. Number one, salvation. Because the gospel changes in the tribulation. Number two, you'll get messed up on eternal security. And all these guys, it's, it cracks me up. I hear all these teachers. I've been listening to a guy, uh, Scott Johnson, listening to him, and he tries to believe in eternal security. But then he turns around and he says, you have to endure to the end to be saved. <laughs> and, it, you know, well, now it doesn't mean salvation necessarily, but yes, it does. See, so these people are getting messed up and it's just going to keep getting worse. And as times get worse and worse and worse, you're going to see more people abandoning the things that they've learned and been assured of. Are you going to? You need to be careful about that. Jump down to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here's some instruction in righteousness. Chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. It says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Verse 2, preach the word. How can you preach it if you don't have it? Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's what you're to do. Okay? And here's the reaction that you're going to get today especially. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. You know, we are at a tremendous disadvantage as King James Bible believers. You say, why? Don't you have the facts? No, we have the facts, but the point is, this is spiritual. The new versions and the other movements are flesh. And everybody has that desire to say, Yea, hath God said. Well, I don't really know. Maybe the King James Bible isn't God's perfect word. Maybe there's some things that are not translated correctly, and I can change it to fit my doctrine. And that's what a lot of people are doing. Okay? Their, their flesh lusts against the Spirit. So it isn't just a, a matter of, well, we'll present our facts and, and the enemy presents their facts. You know, the, the new versionists, they have the flesh on their side. And there's that thing there that appeals to people to correct the word of God and to twist it. Okay? They don't want to come to this book and just say, this is God's book and even questioning it is a sin. They don't want to think that way. Okay? Uh, let's continue on here. Verse 5. You see that people are not going to respond to you there in verses 3 and 4. Verse 5 says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Kept the faith. Verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now, I did a message there on Sermon Audio called Post-Trib Rapture Thieves, and I said that they will steal three things from you. or Well, they'll steal three things, and one of the things was they'll steal your rewards. Right there, the crown of, of uh, righteousness is given to those that love his appearing. And you get all these false prophets coming out saying, Jesus isn't coming back. He's not coming. It's the Antichrist that's coming. It's the one world government. It's the mark of the beast. You might lose your salvation. That's what all these false prophets are doing. They're taking people away from loving the appearing of the Lord. These people aren't looking for Jesus Christ anymore. Okay, it's, it's bad news. Turn over to Colossians chapter 3. Right there you have some motivation, by the way, as a Christian. One of the things that you need to do is you need to look for the appearing of Jesus. You need to love his appearing. Because I believe it's going to happen very soon. <clears throat> but Colossians chapter 3, here's some more motivation for 2011 for you. And we covered this in our Bible study this week. We're going through Colossians, but we'll read it here again. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 says... 
If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Okay? You need to think about things, heavenly things. Okay, Luke chapter 23, or, excuse me, Luke chapter 12, verse 33 and 34 says, uh, Jesus speaking, he said, Sell that ye have and give alms, provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I'm not against preparing for bad times. I have a whole message on that. Could times get rough? Okay, I'm not against preparing. I'm not against having gold and silver, having food, uh, having defensive uh, things. <laughs> I'll say that. I'm not against that. But if that's what the majority of your time is being spent on, uh, then I'm against that. Okay. And by the way, all that stuff could be taken from you in a matter of minutes. I had a dream the one time that for some reason I was out in the woods or something and I came back and there were soldiers all around my house and I realized I couldn't go back in there and it was a, it was a strange dream because it was it, you know it was one of them ones that you wake up and you go man you know it just seems so real but the thought went through my mind I just lost everything and yet they didn't take Jesus Christ away from me and the things that I've done for the Lord, they can't take that away from me. Hey, I mean, some of these survivalist types, I mean, you can stock up. I mean, there are people literally that are stocking up for seven years. I mean, really, there are. And by the way, if you don't believe in a, in the pre-tribulation rapture, that's what you need to do. <laughs> and it cracks me up. These people, there are people out there that teach the post-tribulation rapture and they're not preparing. <laughs> they're not stocking up. It's like, do you really believe you're going to go through the tribulation or don't you? I mean, if I believed I was going through it, I'd be out in the wilderness somewhere, you know, with buckets of five gallon buckets of rice and beans and stuff, you know, <laughs> trying to save up for seven years. But let me tell you something. You could have the greatest bunker, you know, fortified, fully automatic rifles, enough food to last you for 10 years, and it could all be taken away from you like that. All of it. Where's your treasure at? Uh, James chapter 5. I'm going to show you something here real quick. I thought this was kind of interesting. On the subject of gold and silver. For the people that actually are going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, also known as the tribulation, James chapter 5 verses 1 through 3 says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Sounds like they've been storing up stuff. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. You know, at some point in time in the tribulation when all the water is turned to blood and this whole world's ripped apart by war and God's judgment and God's wrath, gold and silver isn't going to mean a thing. <laughs> and there are a lot of people right now that that's all that they're doing. I mean, you wouldn't believe. And, and you know, it, it always cracks me up. There are so many videos online of these guys, the survivalist types, and they're like, you know, telling you need to stock up on gold and silver, and they're making videos of what they have. They're going through their storeroom and they're showing all their food and look how much I've stocked up and here's this huge pile of gold and silver that I've accumulated over the years. You talk about stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you're showing what you have. Guess where people are going to come? <laughs> uh, duh. <laughs> you know, just and bad. The hmm? And the government. Yeah, yeah, and the government. I mean, they're... People are just crazy. And it's so funny because all you need to really do is get your relationship with the Lord straightened out. Amen. You know? And lay up treasures in heaven. Nobody can break in there and take it. 
be up there waiting for you. Keep your priorities straight. Okay? There are rough times coming. I'm going to be straight with you. And I think it's perfectly fine and acceptable to have some of the survival types of things. Just don't get carried away with it. Okay? And don't spend all your time on that and forsake laying up treasure in heaven. So there's some advice for 2011. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18. Here we're going to hear some bragging coming from Paul. And this is very foreign to modern Christians. Second uh, Corinthians 11, 18 says, Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. Hmm. Now let's look at how he glories. Jump down to verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. You speak as a fool when you start to glory. But sometimes you have to say some of it. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Now, I have never met one Christian in my life that could even say they've been through half of that, much less all of it, you know. And yet, he didn't give up. He didn't quit. Hey, if things get really rough... And they could, I don't know. You know, the economy is very, very fragile right now. I mean, think about what would happen if they said no more unemployment, no more welfare. <laughs> Just two little things that they could do and think of what would happen. It could get rough real quick. And yet, you can go through an awful lot of stuff and you still have Jesus Christ. And he goes on there to, to glory about the fact that he's saved. You know? Just something to think about. If times get rough, I mean, we are very, very weak Christians here in America. We've been spoiled rotten. And the reason we've been spoiled is because our Christian forefathers fought for a nation where they could worship the Lord freely. And we talked about that a little bit this morning, about the Revolutionary War. It was about, it wasn't about, we want some kind of thing where we can openly practice perversion and, and where we can do whatever we want. No. They wanted a godly government, a government that feared the Lord, and it exalted this book, the King James Bible, and it allowed Christians to worship the Lord freely. And that's why we have liberty still here in America. Okay, That's why still a lot of the politicians will try to act at least like they're Christians. You know, They'll, they'll give lip service to the whole thing. Now, that's going away. And we're seeing the heathen increasing and increasing. How bad is it going to get before the rapture? I don't know. But the point is, it could get real bad and you can still have joy in the Lord. Uh, turn back to chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 4. We're going to see more things here. It says, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. <laughs> Are you a King James Bible believer? Well, verse uh, 8 there is really going to apply to you. There are going to be people that are going to listen to you and they're going to say, wow, you know, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. I really think that you guys are right and thank you for showing me the truth. There'll be good report. 
But then you're going to have the other people cutting you down and saying you're a cultist and, and you're this and you're that. There's your evil report. And they'll say you're a deceiver. You're a liar. Oh, this King James only stuff is a myth. It's a lie. It's blah, blah, blah. But it's true. It's not a lie. We're not deceivers. We're true. And that's what you're going to have. Uh, verse 9, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. Were you chastened at all of the Lord last year? I was. Guess what? Here I am, I'm alive in 2011. I wasn't killed. The Lord's not done with me yet. And the Lord's not done with you yet if you're still alive too. You know, I, I just heard a, a guy uploaded a message that Dr. Ruckman gave like New Year's Eve, and he was like, well, here we are, it's almost 2011, I don't know why I'm still alive, <laughs> you know, and he's like, just, God's been so good, God's been gracious, he's given me the, the full cup, you know, and, and it's neat to hear him, 89 years old, you know, and living a rough life like he did, why, why is God giving him such long life, because he's not going to waste it. And he's going to continue on. He's going to continue fighting. Now, if the Lord has given you life and you've made it here to 2011, it's because you're doing something for the Lord. The Lord still has a purpose for you. Make sure you use 2011 to bring glory to him. Just a little challenge there. Uh, verse 10. As sorrowful and yet alway rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. If you lose everything, all your physical possessions this coming year as a Christian, you still possess everything. You have eternal life. You have a mansion being built up there in heaven. Crowns of reward, hopefully. You know, if, if you're living right with the Lord, you have everything. And you're going to come back here to this earth for the thousand year millennial reign. You know, okay, well, they took my little house down here and they took my money and they took my guns and they took my books and they took my, yeah, but guess what? I'm coming back in seven years, you know, after the Lord goes and takes me out of here, we'll be coming back and then we'll take everything back <laughs> down here on this earth. Don't worry about it. Things get rough. Well, serve the Lord. Okay, now. If things start getting rough, a lot of people are going to lose faith. A lot of people are going to go crazy. And, you know, things could get pretty bad in 2011. So here's how to keep from going crazy. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. says here, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Are you thankful for what the Lord gave you in 2010? You need to be. Let your request be made known unto God. You should be thanking the Lord for things when you pray. Don't just come to the Lord and say, I want this and I want that and do this for me and do that for me. Thank Him. And uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 5, says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Everything. Uh, don't leave things out. Okay, verse 7. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So you pray and you give thanksgiving and you rejoice in the Lord and you will have peace. And that will keep your mind. That will keep you from going crazy if things get crazy. <clears throat> Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, now we've been over this in our Bible study, but the point is true, honest, and just, that's not always positive. Sometimes those things are negative. Is the country in a bad situation right now? Yeah. 
Is the economy getting worse? Yeah. That See, those things are true. But as a Christian, as a Bible-believing Christian, you can go down and you say, well, you know what? It confirms the Bible. The Bible said that this stuff's going to happen. So, okay. You know, we're going to go through it. Uh, <clears throat> look at verse 9 there. It says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Remember what we read earlier? The things that thou hast learned and been assured of? Continue in those things. Okay, so first thing that you need to do to keep from going crazy is rejoice in the Lord and give thanks in everything. <clears throat> Thank the Lord for 2010. If you messed up in 2010, ask for the Lord's forgiveness. Confess it. Okay, but don't dwell on it. Confess it, forsake it, move forward. You got a brand new year and the Lord's given you life. Do something with it. Okay? And be thankful. Uh, <clears throat> the second thing, turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. The second thing that you need to do to keep from going crazy in 2011 is you need to read the right kind of Bible and you need to, you know, the King James Bible and you need to listen to the right kind of music. Verse 15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Hmm. There it is again. Verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father, by him. So there you see reading the Bible, listening to the right kind of music, and prayer. And that will keep you out of trouble. No matter how bad things get. And I know the first thing, you hear something bad happen, you want to turn on the news, you want, what's going on, what's going on? That shouldn't be the first thing that you do as a Christian. Read the Word of God, listen to hymns, listen to the right kind of music, and pray. Pray about it. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6. We'll go there. Two more places in the Bible to turn to today, and then we're done. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Uh, another thing that you're going to need to do is to stand for the truth and don't back down. Okay, the apostasy is just going to keep getting worse. You need to stand. Continue in the things that thou hast learned and been assured of. That's so important. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, not your own. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That doesn't mean your own flesh. Okay, that means the people out there. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. What are you supposed to do in the evil day? You're to stand. You're not to conform. You're not to change. You're not to say, I need to update. No, you're to stand. And these people that say, I believe in progressive Christianity. We need to be progressive. No, you don't. You need to stand. You need to plant your feet firmly on. And, and say, this is my foundation. I'm not moving. Well, yeah, I think you should compromise a little bit on the Bible version issue. No, I'm not going to compromise. Well, shouldn't you allow some newer music into your... No. No. I'm going to stand. Okay? Well, maybe we ought to consider that, that Jesus might not come back to the end of the tribulation. No. He's coming back before it. The Bible teaches it. I'm going to stand there. That's the way it has to be. Verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You better stand. We are in the evil day. 
Okay, I think that uh, maybe before the flood in the days of Noah was probably the only other time in history that it was as bad as it is right now. Okay, I mean worldwide. I know there was Sodom and Gomorrah and there was, you know, ancient Babylon and whatever. But worldwide, I think that there's never been an evil time except for maybe before the flood. And then I don't know if it was as bad as it is right now. I mean, it's getting bad quick. And you're going to need to stand in that time. And you're going to need to have on the whole armor of God. Okay, uh, Romans chapter 8. This is where we're going to finish up today. You know, there's a hymn, Standing on the Promises of Christ my King. Standing on the Promises. You know, and that's that's important to remember. And I'm going to give you some good promises here that relate very much to today. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now you study church history sometime. That was true for most of church history. And as I stated earlier, it was only true. This isn't true. You know, this hasn't happened to most Christians in America. Simply because, you know, our founding fathers fought for religious liberty. That's why we haven't had to experience this as Christians here living in America or the UK, you know, but that could come again. It will eventually. I don't know how much of it we're going to get to see. But verse 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present. Is it getting, is it bad? How is 2010? It's pretty bad nor things to come, 2011. What's coming? Well, the Lord knows. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pretty much doesn't matter what's going to come in 2011. Nothing's going to separate us from the love of the Lord, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay? So, God's given you another year of life. Do something with it. That's the challenge for this morning, the sermon for this morning. Like I said, not real big doctrinal. Just a reminder that uh, you have responsibilities for the Lord. Forget the things that are behind. Okay? Press forward. So that's it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.